time for Perf Bites. What the f*** is Perf Bites? The fourth square meal of the day. Don't bogart the Perf Bites. Fuck waffles. Add nutritional value to your brain. Perf Bites. Whatever. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Perf Bites, brought to you through the miracle of video. I know it's probably been many years where you've longed to see my face associated with the Perf Bites podcast, where you were tortured uh, by just the audio up to this point. Um, well, exciting as it may be, we are now live on YouTube. And our topic today is performance requirements. And I'm happy to sort of revisit performance requirements in 2021, sort of the end of 2021 going into Almost 2022. 2022. That's right. And the strange, uh, not disembodied voice that you just heard is my amigo friend, Leandro Melendez, senior performer. Uh, Leandro, how are you? Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this video and also still audio version of our podcast where, as Mark uh, mentioned, we will be revisiting, rejuvenating, putting some Botox or what would be um, sun cream, something good. I'm not, I'm not sure about yeah, the Botox or, thing. Or but... uh, a plastic surgery. You could have a requirement rejuvenation uh, uh, surgery. So it's maybe we'll your give face it some re interesting rejuvenate. curves and... Yeah, Weird reshaping your there. requirements. Yeah, for the <laughs> for so your requirements can feel younger and more youth, youthful. Um, and to join us uh, with his uh, his uh, potentially scalpel um, in the requirements category is our other good friend Henrik Rexed. Henrik, uh, I'm glad to be on uh, the show with you today because um, we, I don't we've never we've only done like rando podcasts in the Neotis land. This is our first actual like perf bites uh, podcast let together. me think through it i think we did uh i may have done some uh news of the dam i think a few two or three episodes oh, no exactly. and we were on some pac specials yeah awesome. remember that's true see yeah there you go it's just been forever um and talking but, about uh, modernizing uh, so here we're gonna tattoo ourselves performance requirements so as as we speak you don't see it on the camera but i have a a tattoo, uh, a guy who's, who's uh, going to tattoo on my leg. Uh, I love performance requirement just for this episode. So uh, I, I will show you yes. next time we, I visit you at the United States. That's that's he, nice. And You will be getting one like, per episode. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would also say uh, the um, uh, in, back in the day in the web days of requirements, um, for the most part, we had uh, like you could tattoo six seconds right to your forehead. <laughs> Because everyone said <laughs> all web apps should be six, second, six seconds or less. Um, and um, then people had to have that tattoo removed when so they, you're saying when that we the, the, introduced the, web services. So the Satan number comes from that requirement that maybe probably one, <laughs> one guy did once, six seconds. And then the, the next month he did it twice. Then it was 66 seconds. And they said, shit. So let's put a six, extra six. So yeah, and there's always an Actually, I think it's, it's more like yeah, yeah. So the, the business requirements were to go six seconds. But when you started adding in that call to the database and three round trips to an external web service, it was 659 <laughs> seconds. No, it's 650. In ancient times, it was 666 seconds. Like uh, it yeah, keeps evolving right. and getting smaller. It keep, all those that's things. right. Now, it's, <laughs> now with web services, it's 666 milliseconds. Milliseconds. Uh, Exactly. Uh, but you'll have to tune into the News of the Dam to see if Satan will make some commentary <laughs> on that uh, as well. Um, we usually have a few announcements at the beginning of our shows. Um, and so I would just like to say thank you both uh, to you, Leandro and Henrik, for sort of kicking off and, and in launching us into the YouTube era as you both have fantastic YouTube channels and growing followings. Uh, Henrik, in the Is It Observable, you still raise the, the valid question of, is it observable? And so uh, you are, your channel is growing and people should go check it out. Um, but absolutely, how's it going? What's coming up? Uh, so uh, I just released uh, the last uh, Thursday a uh, dedicated episode on the SQL commenter. So, uh, so if you're looking at solution yeah. that will bring uh, any details related to your SQL execution on the database and have it in an open telemetry trace, then this framework should probably be very useful for a project. So it's a dedicated episode. And because it, yeah. the topic is so wide, I did two part, two distinct episodes. So one with the more the explanation yeah. and the other one more on the tutorial. But yeah, the, the channel is growing uh, slowly, uh, but it's growing. So it's positive. Um, 
I have uh, some key targets. I, I initially I target one thousand subscribers at the end of the end of this year. <laughs> I, I cross the fingers. Maybe we'll come on we'll be able to reach that objective. We'll see. You can do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, if people are uh, looking right now, not only should they go down below and click on this podcast, like and subscribe, and Le hit the links bell, magic up here bell. in the screen in the magic of YouTube. Uh, there you can click up there and go to his yeah. channel and hit subscribe, hit the bell, hit yeah. like, and all those cool things. And leave a comment because Henrik loves comments, um, particularly snarky, humorous comments. <laughs> That are funny, <laughs> and then we can use them in the show. Uh, really great. But I, you, you're doing some fantastic things uh, in the is it observable world, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, how is your you're working for Dynatrace now, and that's going really well, I see. Yeah, so uh, I started uh, the last of April, so now it's almost <laughs> eight months that I joined uh, Dynatrace. It's uh, and I'm very uh, yeah, yeah. happy and excited. It's, it's a great company, to be honest. If you're uh, if you like technology yeah. and you want to. Yeah, deep dive in something. Dynatrace is uh, is supporting you, and uh, yeah, I'm super happy about it. And uh, I got the freedom to to yeah. have this uh, YouTube channel, have the support, and uh, and uh, yeah, and there's a lot of great technical people uh, in the company. So if you need any help, there's always someone helping you. So it's it's re I'm really happy about it. And also yeah, that's uh, something awesome. that and I Leandro, also, of course. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, something that I, I also did. Uh, with the is it observable? I, I, or in fact, I, I started to do it with a PAC um, here and there, with those fake uh, uh, commercials that I did. Uh, and now, since I launched yeah. the channel, I have this. Uh, yeah, that's it's sort of it's, it's like a duty. I have to do it. So every two weeks, every second week, I have to come up to a, a stupid idea, uh, to put on camera. Uh, that and the, the 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 duration needs to be under two minutes. So as of now, it's been all... I if I may yeah. say, the latest one was not stupid. I liked a lot, like the detective noir style that you had between the rain, it was a dark night. Yes. Suddenly, observability knocked on my door, something like that. But it was really cool. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, exactly. It's, uh, it's the raven, you know, the observability traces knocking, knocking at my data center dough. Exactly. <laughs> I like that. Uh, and Leandro, of course, you are, are still, we uh, recently had a release of the performers are coming along uh, and uh, a few other things you're doing in the world, including your book. So congratulations again. If people didn't really see all the announcements, uh, that's uh, fantastic. You can now get it in hardcover if you just, and maybe you get Leandro to sign it someday in hardcover. It's permanent. The Hitchhiking oh, yeah. Guide to Load Tests. Um, and how are things going? So... People are liking the book. I'm hearing good uh, replies, good observations, good feedback, and uh, good news as well, because uh, it seems like Amazon finally decided to export it from the Amazon uh, printers in the US to other places in Latin America. I've heard cool. it arrived uh, as far as Uruguay and Argentina. So everyone in Latin America that was asking if they could get it, and I was like, uh, 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 well, finally you yep. can. Hardcover as yeah. well. So, yeah. 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 Those got great news. I'm liking that. And yeah, that's very cool. And uh, perhaps somewhere in the new year, we'll have a Espanol version of the book. Uh, not that close. Um, sadly, because it has so many jokes and pop references and things that, um, believe it or not, the, Pr the Princess Diary movie that I have some references don't exist or it's not well known in Latin America, I need to find equivalents for my jokes and so on. Oh, that's so right. So culturally related. it doesn't translate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not only translating textually, but also technical terms, which also are a very good challenge to translate on some that I don't even yeah. know if the term exists in Spanish. Yeah. And as well, some of those uh, geek and pop, pop culture things that I need to, um, I, I don't know, uh, geo... geo uh, localized Geo, or something like that. Geo -lo localized, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so if you're uh, not able, to, congratulations on that again. Go ahead, Henrik. Yeah, so if you're not able to to translate it to Spanish, I would recommend to do it in French, uh, because I, I'm pretty sure <laughs> that the, the, the French market will be very happy to get your book as well, which ah, is yeah. awesome. By the way, your book is great. Awesome. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, pardonnez-moi, je ne parle pas le français. 
but um, you can also get some references. It would be very interesting to see how some of those silly things translate into French. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Or if and even though we don't we don't have many uh, events coming up, but there is one in particular uh, that we're very fond of. If you've followed Perf Bites in the podcasting world and our uh, Amigo podcast peer performance uh, with Andy Grabner and Brian, um, is Dynatrace Perform. So hopefully, Henrik, we might be able to make it uh, to perform. We haven't heard much, but you know, we're fingers crossed. Maybe we'll make it there to do some live broadcasting with cameras and stuff. That would be fun. And yeah, I think bring a lot of value. I think uh, the community deserves to get uh, live interviews of uh, speakers or any people in the conference. Uh, I mean, so far, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's my best tech conference that I've been uh, the last four, six years. I think uh, there is uh, people has, yeah, is all very uh, positive, uh, always want to discuss about performance. So if you're a, if you like performance and observability, then this conference is for you. Yeah. Yeah, it is pretty cool. I'll say even uh, if you're, even if you're not a Dynatrace customer, you should go. <laughs> uh, because there's tons, of the, it's very open in terms of other, like you were working for Neotis, we were independent, we have people with different partners that are bringing in all sorts of different tools, like during the hands-on training, there's like two days of hot day workshops. Uh, and I, we've taught, Henrik, you've taught one, I've taught one. Uh, it's fantastic deep dive, sort of somewhat agnostic, but you know, definitely demonstrating stuff you can do with Dynatrace, but all of the learning is applicable in many, many ways. So don't just go to the conference to sort of sit in the big audience with the cool neon lighting. Uh, and don't go, you know, hang with those cool podcasting kids. We should definitely uh, tune in. But it's a, it's in the beginning of February, right? Like so people will tune in live, uh, live streaming and all sorts of stuff should be pretty cool. Uh, yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. You guys have any other announcements? Anything else going on? Uh, I would just like to invite everyone listening to um, hit and subscribe. I'm going to also add a link up here on the screen on the YouTube channel to Señor Performo, Awesome Performers in English, which yeah, yeah. Uh, by the time you hear this the episode, most probably will be already uh, live where I explain the bees and the flowers, the churros and the donuts about how to create automations. How do they work? How does that wait, happen? Wait a minute. Do, do you mean <laughs> birds and bees? Like wh where oh, do automated Oh, birds and bees, script? yeah. I, I yeah. never got hey. why birds and bees. What happens in between those? That's weird. Well, not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, if a bird and a bee uh, they are into feels, it, uh, feel we, we strongly about one another and they love one another <laughs> very much, birds and bees, you know, maybe there, there might be some genetic fertility issues, you know, between the let's, two. Let's and maybe the here families. in donuts and churros. Uh, so, donuts so and I churros. Can... So, so yeah. who is calling the exactly. honey? <laughs> who is the honey in, in that couple? <laughs> I can, wait, this, um, that's a different, totally different podcast. <laughs> good night, kids. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks. <and laughs> see ya. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> that's, that's really funny, actually. Uh, so, so, yeah. Uh, but mommy, where do test scripts come from? Yeah, exactly. So, Low yeah. test automations, how they are done, how do they work? Yeah. And um, yeah. so that everyone can understand a little bit better, because I have some plans on explaining some tools, some other concepts. And this is the cornerstone. We need to begin and start learning where do those yeah. come from, how do they work, how to make them. And yeah. uh, stay tuned. Hit subscribe, like, and all those yeah. things. I hope you like yeah, it. Cool. Lots of graphs and little things. Yeah. And generally, it's just really nice to be back with you guys. Uh, the the perf biting perf biting listen listener audience now on YouTube. Let's talk about requirements in 2021 or the end of 2021 moving forward because I think performance requirements. As an episode when we did it before, we covered Scott Barber's desirements. We covered um, sort of someone showing up in a factory style. Hey, give me your non-functional requirements, and I will then go do the load testing and you know by the machine robot testing. You know that's fine. There are places that that's really really important to to be that stringent and that that uh, uh, structured. Um, but not all places now in 2021. There's agile performance. There's uh, sort of more exploratory testing, mob testing that has kind of made its way into performance testing. Plus now, as you point out, Henrik, observability. Well, we don't do load testing. 
we just observe everything. And so we got traces and we got logs, we got metrics, we got things flying around, but we, we're not really having like requirements. Um, and both of you have done some work recently in talking about SLAs, SLAs, SLIs, SLOs on the channel. So do you see performance requirements changed a bit nowadays than, than when James and I talked about it before, or even before that? Oh, uh, hell. I think yeah. it really depends how the maturity of the organization. It really depends because if the yeah. the the project is uh, highly mature and and doing uh, heavily load performance testing directly at, at a dev perspective, um, so people yeah. try to get different type of requirements because you're pretty uh, relay, uh, attached to the small scope, uh, the small the small component you're testing. So the they are a notion of requirement because you have to express somehow what how to validate if there is no regressions between version one, version two, and and so on. Um, but if you right. take the the traditional big bang load test that usually happens uh, maybe right. on uh, uh, on on at the end of a cycle or uh, when we are on a hardening yeah. or whatever, then I think the way yeah. we deliver that type of test because we do a lot of end to end. Uh, test and we validate different type of things. I think there is still a certain notion of requirement somehow, because even if we deliver our project in Agile, this type of activities of testing the Big Bang load test is a waterfall project part of the Agile process somehow. Um, but okay. I think, yeah, I think the requirements has significantly changed, but um if you do uh, traditional Black Friday testing, it's going to be more or less the same approach that we have a few yeah. years back. Of course, but the requirement has changed because the technology has changed. So then we we are we have other things to deal with and and to manage. So I think the of course requirement has changed based on the evolution of the technology, of course, as well. Yeah, and uh, Leandro, I think um, when it comes to sort of SLAs in the old days, service level agreements service level objectives, service level uh, indices or indicators. Um, I'm going back 12 years, maybe 15 years, where we saw SLAs start making their way into load testing tools so you could sort of drive the pass-fail criteria uh, almost for that load test based on SLAs. Um, when you guys talked about it recently, do you see requirements getting pushed, sort of shifting left into the tooling or even further? just based on what SLOs are for, for production? And in, in part, yeah. And in, in um, expanding it a little bit from what uh, Hendrik was mentioning, that they are changing, um, I think some of them are evolving, are moving mm -hmm. from, from places, as uh, you said, Mark, uh, some are on the left, some that before were totally forbidden, are totally shifted to the right, at the very end of the right, and that was a big taboo, uh, as you said, uh, like yeah. a decade ago, thou shall yeah. not touch production. And yeah. um, some of those have been switching off from places. Some organizations have been understanding them better. And with these distinctions that we were mentioning, like it's not just an SLA, it's not just that single <laughs> digit um, tattooed on your forehead, as you were saying. Now you have yeah. like, hundreds of different elements that you have to count as requirements. And uh, as you can see, we're getting larger foreheads to add all of those requirements in the uh, with the tattoos. Because, uh, yeah, we have to pay attention to many, many more things than yeah. uh, I would say before or even some new requirements or some new adaptations. Because with these continuous changes, as uh, Henrik was saying, you had one blast and done and see you in six months, hopefully if you have a release, but now you have to evolve and add one that was a single SLI, just this response yeah. time, this CPU happened. And now we have deviations, we have variances, we have analysis over time, if they are improving, if we add notifications, and not only at a single metric level, as you mentioned, now we have traces, now we have some other concepts that End to end, we need to start to analyze that um, things are still working. And to add up, I think it's not anymore that single metric of six seconds for everything, which I think yeah. never was particularly okay to do it that way. Right. Um, 
we now have to check context. We sometimes pay attention to some uh, requirements. Some others, we as performance engineers, we would come in our price and say, no, 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 no. You don't even need to pay attention to that. Um, just to give you a quick example from a recent experience, how many users can my system handle? Well, what do your users do on the system? I don't mm -hmm. know. Okay, why don't we talk about throughput instead? Number of actions or um, because, and that's another one, the number of user requirement or li limit um, measurement feels a bit outdated to me. And that yeah. falls into several outdated um, requirements or measurements that are evolving and need to be evolving and are still yeah. evolving. So beware. But yeah. I think Henry, you mentioned go ahead, SLI. Henry, go ahead. Yeah, you mentioned SLI in, in SLO. I think that was the best tooling that uh, was uh, uh, for, for performance engineers, in fact. So I think the people, I mean, when you utilize SLI and SLOs in production, of course, you want to focus on your users and come up with a couple of SLOs just to measure the availability, latency, and the errors, mm -hmm. and so on. But when, when we use it as performance engineer, we could be very smarter. We can say, okay, I'm going to take those production SLOs because I have to keep track on those, uh, even in a non-production environment. But then I can introduce more performance SLIs or SLOs where I can also mm -hmm. have requirements, say, about speed on specific, specific transactions. But I probably yeah. want to also make sure that my, system, that my environment also... Uh, healthy, uh, because it doesn't make sense to say, hey, it's green because our response is in or two, two, two seconds or whatever the, the number. But if my environment is completely saturated, then it doesn't make sense to go further. So I think in a performance world, there's so many different dimensions to handle. And I think we should uh, say proud and loudly that, yes, I'm going to use the production SLO, but I'm going to add extra SLOs that will help me to automate and validate uh, the asset that comes out of the performance testing. Because yeah, that's, so it, that's it, a very good point. You don't need uh, some requirements in production that definitely you need to add. And we're talking about, as you were saying, Mark, the shifting left requirements. We have different ones for a developer. Hey, senor developer, when you are creating uh, your new code, let's say your requirement is to not to do full table scans and 10 yeah. connections to the database. That's that's a very small one, blah, blah, blah. But that probably you don't want to have in production because, well, yeah, in production probably you will have several, not full table scans, hopefully, um, but connections to the database. You may be having some hundreds uh, at a time and that'll be yeah. okay. But for a single developer at the very left, you have also other requirements that are, are very important to distinguish and say where some of them goes, where some of them do not go, or how they yeah. will be different on different uh, ends of the left and right spectrum of projects. Yeah. yeah, the thing that strikes me is there's this idea of, you know, the minimal viable product, which is in the sort of startup, lean startup or, or um, the, any project or even like a whole company startup, the minimum viable product, which is very common in the agile world and, and in the lean world. And I think the P should be minimum viable performance. So to your point, um, Henrik, that we should, we can, we can have an idea of what the business requirement is, what an end user requirement is for response time, or even Leandro throughput, like you mentioned, let's talk about actions or throughput for given actions or service calls. I think don't go overboard. Some people will be like, oh, you know, the perfect guys say we should, you know, doc, add all these things. And so they'll go to every single story and build test requirements and <clears throat> performance criteria excuse me, acceptance criteria for everything, response times, how much CPU, and they'll go nuts versus saying what's, what's the most critical or what's the minimum viable performance for aligned to the MVP so we can actually put this iteration out the door. And then Henrik, I think you're right. You'll grow that to say, oh, we're now we're adding on this layer of, of a new set of components. There's a couple more extra metrics for SLIs that will link up and grow, grow, grow. And I think that's changed from the old days of you have to know everything and write it all down as requirements and then go into the next phase of testing. So 
So I think that's a that's a big change. Um, generally, that's that's an important element, I would say. Because uh, yes, please, please, please don't go overboard and try to add a requirement on absolutely everything. That uh, also becomes a bottleneck, kind of pun intended, in your flow yeah. of software into production or yeah. uh, releasing good software. So yeah, and that's that's a part of the importance that I was mentioning earlier. You need to come in and assess what is important in which steps and not go overboard because you can be floated by measurements on your requirements and trying to com accomplish them all. Uh, some are worthy and sometimes the one, the data, the database connection requirement that I mentioned earlier, if I'm not doing any data records, why to have it on every requirement or every new task? So be smart and try to be wise on what requirements are you adding on which situations? No one size fits all. No silver bullets. Uh, everything in performance, I keep saying it, is tailor suited. As you were saying, Mark, uh, what uh, should I do on every situation? And my answer is always, it depends. It depends a yeah. lot on what is the context. Yeah. Let me ask you guys this question. Sort of generally in your work and in, in talking with practitioners and customers, in the agile space or the impact, I'll say, as industry-wide agile brings us, more and more people, I, I speak to them now and they're more tuned in because we have a product owner, because dev uh, teams are not in under a rock over here and test teams are separated over there and the business is separated over there uh, and the tech ops team separated over there. It seems like everyone is I talk to is more aware of each other. And so... The idea that if you want to start a conversation about performance around response time or how number of users or number of transactions or how many machines do we run on or how is this really implemented in the real world, everyone's a little more tuned in than they were 20 years ago, where you would write stuff down because that was the only vehicle to start educating these siloed teams. And it seems to me now that we start with smaller scopes and everyone seems more tuned in which changes the conversation that you and me can and the practice the rest of us can have early on with a developer about performance. Oh, let's let's talk about how many threads you're going to run. And they're like, oh yeah, 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 I talk about threads all the time with my ops guys. Or let's talk about how many real customers are part of this campaign. Oh yeah, well I was just talking with the product owner and the business analyst just yesterday in the lunchroom. Blah blah blah. To me, that's pretty cool. I think I think that makes a performance conversation more ubiquitous. And to me, that's where requirements really come from, are meshing all of these disciplines together and asking questions around time, resources, the things we classically engineer for, right? I agree with you. I think, um, I think if you jump back 12 years ago, or even more, in fact, um, the yeah. people were performance engineering or performance testing at that time was like a... Uh, a checkbox in Excel sheet and people either didn't understand the concept, uh, the risks, uh, the impact. So uh, we were basically trying to fight or not fight, but argue with those teams to say, hey, I need this uh, information because otherwise my tests won't be relevant or I won't be able to do a good job. And I think now, yeah. uh, I think probably it's the... Uh, the, the, the to the generation that was uh, born in 2000s or, or before that has now our customers that are being born with great co internet connections, not great, but at least much more <laughs> better than the one we had in one we, a yeah. couple of years back. The baby yeah. came with Wi-Fi? But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Better than a 14.4 modem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. and also the devices that they use, they, they, they all bas basically they were born almost in the same time with the iPhone. So the user experience yeah. was something that they were used to and they don't even yeah. know what is that. The old HTML page, like uh, blurring and blanking everywhere. That was ridiculous. But uh, at that yeah. time we were, we, we thought it was pretty cool. The progressive the rendering that was really <laughs> slow and image placeholder <laughs> stuff that would pop, you know, over time. And yeah, yeah. So I think, I think that that's, but, that's, that's uh, the, a fact that um, people, uh, customers are expecting a lot. And I think now, Teams know that um, if you 
deliver something that is unperformance, then yeah, it's going to be a disaster. So I think that's great. So people are yeah. aligned. We're working together and collaborating, and it's much more easier to get those information that was quite challenging a few years back. Yeah, Leandro, let me ask you this. Um, in, in the same idea, from the business side of the house, um, we also have an executive suite that's much more technically savvy than before when maybe it was the first time they saw technical requirements written down in a plan with a thing. Now you've got a corner office that you could say, hey, if we can double the number of throughput for code efficiency, if we can optimize our systems to support twice or three times the throughput, they can see the connection between capacity and growth with business growth. And that conversation seems to be much, much easier around, hey, what are our real requirements for the future for growth? Do you see that as well? Yeah. Well, yeah, no. Uh, I mean, yeah. the, 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 the advantage of uh, being jumping with one customer to the other, at times you will see the ones that, uh, yeah, we are agile using a laser. And uh, for the ones that are not <laughs> seeing me and are just listening, I'm doing quotation marks, yes, air yes. quotes. And some, some of these are not truly out of the silo and the pandemic even made it worse. Sure. And you, you have even a hardest time to reach out to other members. But on the other hand, that as well is, is an impact where even management is aware of your GitHub repository, that you have the code here and how more or less it works. And it's not strange to them anymore. Or, or, and, and even it's a great advantage that I totally love from the old days where I would never see the code of the tested application. And right yeah. now I can go there, touch it, see what is happening. Maybe even put my finger at, hey, line 26, that's that's yeah. a problem. Uh, and management, most of the time, are more they, they are more or less uh, on board with the things. You have a closer line to explain some of uh, the situations yeah. and why they should care about some of the requirements that you are um, being a pain in the derriere for them, why yeah. why um, they should pay, pay paying attention to them. And, and personally, I can say it gives me a better channel to go and do my silly examples and tell them, hey, you should pay attention at these because otherwise you are running, racing your car um, to test it instead of putting a dashboard on it, right? So yeah. it's... It is closing the gap. It's making easier to communicate, collaborate, and educate the rest of the team on, because that's one of the things that I think I say the most to the teams. Hey, yeah. the performance engineer is not anymore the scripter. It's not anymore just the person that you throw requirements at the end of the sprint down to the basement, but you have the performers locked yeah. to generate scripts and run load tests. Right. Um, no, we're running together. We're um, helping people or yeah. explaining, teaching them and enabling them on what to do to assure performance and what requirements to pay attention on. And a side yeah. effect, I would say, when you get closer with the teams in this uh, these terms, some of them will bring requirements that you as a performer didn't even thought about. And that's yeah. super cool. I, I really like when they say, hey, and this shipment, I'm putting one material at a time. Wouldn't it better to measure that we can put them all at once? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> Mind blowing. And I'm like, Single okay, let code, that yeah, new yeah, requirement. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, absolutely. Yeah. Lots of yeah. synergies. So, to me, the source of requirements hasn't changed as much. It's still business. It's still technical. It's still end user. It can still be related to functionality for the objectives of what you're doing. But I think the ease of which where we find these requirements, a requirement or desirement, or just our goals, like, hey, this is what we want to know or learn as we move forward, uh, hasn't changed that much. But how we gather them and the ease of which we can maybe ha talk to people about performances is much better. Um, I'd like to take a little bit of a break uh, here in the middle. Hola amigos, it is me, Leandro, aka Señor Performo, together with Perf Bytes Press, announcing that by the end of June, we will start a pre-sale of my baby, finally reaching the Amazon bookstore, the hitchhiking guide to load testing projects. 
a fun step-by-step -step guide, or level-by-level -level, may I say, that will guide you through your load testing adventures. More details to come soon. Beware. Uh, and I'll uh, take our break first by saying I have a public service announcement, and that's for those of you in our industry who sometimes would like to step forward with a uh, blank Excel spreadsheet and a meeting with the product owner and just uh, as a load tester, you sit down and you hand them a blank Excel spreadsheet and you say, could you please tell me your non-functional requirements? Um, please understand that this is setting up an antagonistic relationship whereby you are 100% dependent on the product owner to know everything there is about performance. And the process you're engaged in is, as Leandro just pointed out, to take those whatever they put on the sheet which could be bogus, and go down to the basement, pretend you're doing some serious load testing that's <laughs> relevant to the project, and then bring that back and say, here are the results of your non-functional testing. This is bad performance testing. Um, it's good if you fill in all the blanks around the process and every product owner knows, hey, you need to think about what is a performance requirement? What are our objectives? What do the ops guys think? If you have an audience of all the players and you facilitate, hey, let's talk about performance and what the goals and objectives are. If you're facilitating it, and then together as a team, you start writing down and filling in that spreadsheet together, that's actually more productive than whatever's written on the sheet because you're building relationships and you're putting all sorts of things together and, and understanding each other and, and putting together a common objective and then when you go to the basement, because you're still going to go to the basement, you're still going to go to the basement like and it. run the load test. But when you come back, they'll be like, oh, yeah, that was that thing we all agreed upon. And hey, it's nice to see you again. I'm sorry it's so cold in the basement and you look like you have hypothermia. But we got these fantastic load test results and that helps us feel more confident. So don't just show up and do the bare minimum fill in the functional requirements thing, the non-functional. I, I can't stand that. You need to be the trusted also, advisor. Yeah. You need to be the trusted advisor to the team. Otherwise, you will just do and, the and like a tr like deliver. a trusted facilitator. Yeah, yeah. No, no. And from what you were saying, I would say also a teacher. Don't don't give them the fish just uh, and expect them to know how to pick it or what to do with it. Because yes. in the story that you said, eventually the next time you won't have to come and explain everything. They were like, "Hey, ah, there comes a performance guy. There, we have your uh, XML ready." Yeah. yeah, or go, they'll go look at you and basement. say, yeah, and also, where's the fish? Like, we, we, that, <laughs> uh, we want some fish. Like, come on. We, I thought we was going to get good. fish. Out of this. <laughs> it was good fish. I was expecting maybe a nice filet, maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe it's bronzino or something like that. Uh, uh, another thing we do on the break here, um, out of the public service announcement, maybe, Henrik, maybe we need to make a, a funny video to go with the non-functional requirements PSA. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Um, let's talk about jobs. Jobs. Steve? Um, I have a couple to share. Um, usually we want to just take a few minutes. One, I have a, like one opportunity showed up from a good friend, Lorinda Brandon, who's working at Better Cloud. She pinged me a little while ago about, hey, would you, are you still contracting, consulting? Or we might actually have a full-time position to do performance engineering for Better Cloud. So take a look. I think it's bettercloud.com or Better cloud.io or something like that. Check them out. Um, and they have uh, offices all over. I think it's mostly remote. If you're interested in just jumping in the cloud performance world, um, let me know. Um, that could be interesting. Or reach out to Lorinda. She's on, uh, she's on Twitter and stuff like that. Um, I got another one from Think Systems. Um, again, US citizens and residents on this one. Performance engineer, 100% remote. Um, they pinged me. I don't, I think Think Systems is a consulting house. Do you use that? I think we can go look that up, I suppose. Don't know. I have no idea. Don't know it. Be fine. Don't know much about <laughs> that one. Um, there's, uh, if you're near Dayton, Ohio, beautiful. Actually, there was a lot of great like R&B funk bands that came out of Ohio, like, like the Ohio players, I think. Um, there's one for a performance test manager. Uh, again, uh, full-time, if you're full-time visa, U.S. citizen, um, in Dayton, Ohio, it's more like a performance test manager, uh, maybe a lead, I'm guessing it could be manager or a lead of the teams or something like that. And another one uh, where they couldn't tell us, uh, which is a great, uh, great thing 
Henrik for you, is a customer that's transitioning from App Dynamics to Dynatrace. Uh, also has a senior performance engineer, W two full time job in Charlotte, Hopewell, New Jersey, and Dallas. Hmm. -hmm. I, hmm I wonder what company that is. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, <laughs> but it's in the financial sector, so it's a bank in uh, in potentially Charlotte. So if you're interested in any of these things, you can shoot us an email at jobs at perfbytes.com or reach out to uh, these people, go hunting. We can, who knows, we're happy to pass along these opportunities. Um, Henrik, uh, Leandro, do you guys have any other opportunities you're looking for? I think uh, I saw uh, on the, the social networks that uh, Tricentis was looking for a couple of, uh, uh, of pre-sales and, and consultants in the performance world. Yeah. So if you uh, want to join yep. a, a software vendor, like Tricentis, you could definitely reach out to them. Uh, they were probably looking for, uh, for which, people like you. Yeah, which could could formerly be in your former world with Neoload, so maybe supporting the Neoload products, um, or our good friends uh, in the Flood, Flood.io, that Tricentis bought it. The Flood is still uh, Tricentis Flood. So there could be some really cool tool-based stuff that you're doing there um, that could be really exciting. So yeah, reach out to Tricentis, or we have some contacts there we can send you send you along to there. That would be just fine. Um, I think uh, in uh, uh, Alois in Dynatrace was putting some stuff out in the captain team, maybe. I think there was some engineering opportunities there. So uh, yeah, specifically to observability. So if you have any open telemetry experience yeah. uh, and if you like to uh, innovate uh, and uh, try to also advocate, uh, then uh, you could definitely reach yeah. out. We're looking for people that has been working uh, and uh, yeah, delivering some uh, project to instrument and implement open telemetry over so customers. So if you're interested, reach out to us cool. at danatrace.com. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. Leandro, anything in your world? And last, I uh, would give some heads up in the services uh, area. Um, the company, our amigos at Qualitest Group, um, yeah. they are always needing more people for performance, for general QA, project management, yep. lots of things. I would recommend go to workable.com, look for Qualitest, and you'll find a myriad of positions there that you can go and check which one fits you worldwide, yeah. um, remote, on-site, all the mixes, some sponsors. So yeah. you can uh, go and find uh, very good options. And on the Mexican side, some amigos of mine from IT mm -hmm. Stark, that's the name um, yeah. of the service company based on Saltillo. They have several yeah. positions where they like to help people uh, studying and get into the software testing world, even if there's no, not much experience or if you're yeah. seasoned, of course, they will be happy to meet you. So if yeah. anyone around uh, Mexico is interested, give them a call. IT Stark, look for them, I would say in Google. I don't remember the address, sadly. Yeah. But as Mark said, it must be itstark.com.com.mx or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah. And lots of positions there. Go and look at Very it. Very cool. Uh, yeah, So, if, and if there's anything that we, the three of us could do to help you find a new position, uh, or if you have questions about what should I do next in my career, what kind of performance type role should I go for, you could also read James's James Pulley's book, uh, which just came out about hiring performance engineers. So you could sort of get some insights from James's book about what are people hiring for and what what's good hiring? How should I? Yeah, so we get a little plug for James's book there, don't we? That would be good. Awesome. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's jump in the last part of our show here, part two, um, which is to just, as I said, non-functional. Remember that phrase, non-functional requirements? Well, what's mm. the difference between a non-functional requirement and a functional requirement, Leandro? So I generally on this give a very straight and dictionary definition to be able yes. to differentiate, um, mostly departing from performance testing, because the rest of uh, requirements to, for quality that are functional, well, uh, very straightforward, is around functionality, that something yeah. does what it's supposed to do. Mm, yeah, straight and simple, I would say. Don't uh, yeah. kill me, people from functional. If I um, uh, I'm mis um, misplacing or doing it smaller than it is, but sounds a little bit straightforward to me with my non so functional side. But getting into the yeah. dictionary term for uh, performance testing, 
and are non-functional, but I will depart from performance testing. This is the one that I like to yeah. use uh, as an example for the rest. Um, yeah. The definition for performance, plain and simple, is how fast, how good, how efficient something is. What yeah. you're checking uh, when you talk about performance. And testing is verify, validate, measure, be aware of uh, checking. So to, uh, uh, b both of those are checking or evaluating how well, how fast, um, how efficient something is in terms of software performance, well, how a piece of software or a solution um, is, uh, how efficient, how good, how fast it is. Yeah, yeah. The rest that do not fall into that function, I think, are part of those non-functionals like security, like usability, sure. which I, I have some... Um, Difficulties with that term, the non-functional, because some yeah. is a very blurry line to say, uh, this is definitely around functionality and it's, uh, or this is just non-functional. Well, I, this won't function if it doesn't perform. Mm, makes well, me- Wait I mean, a minute. What do you mean? What do you mean perform? Do you mean speed? Do you mean, does it dance? Does it play beautiful music? Does it play the flute? <laughs> play the flute? Magic tricks as well. That's, that's Magic part tricks. of uh, doing a yeah. performance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. In in in, it's. I'll, I'll follow that joke. Joke. If it yeah. doesn't dance fast enough, well enough, pretty enough, it's not working. It's not yeah. functioning. It may so, it may check the box in terms of button does do X. Check yes. Box. But I appears. never managed to do check. X because I, it sucks. It was so slow. And it was so ugly, like cosmetic bugs. To me, cosmetic bugs, even though they fall in the UI world and it's, a, you know, they'll, they get counted as functionality bugs. Well, cosmetic bugs <laughs> are actually non-functional because it could be really ugly, but usable. So I'm like, that's no, no, no. not it, functional. It returns what it's supposed to, but it's on a mobile device and my twinky fingers just cannot press it. <laughs> But it's, yeah, it's too small. It's not accessibility, right? It's, it's, you, oh, accessibility, can't that's use accessibility it. accessibility as well, yeah. Exactly. Or, or, or. So there's this, this sort of leftover bucket of, oh, I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't do that. I just make sure the button. So it's like we live in the performance world in this, in this fray with accessibility. The ill at ease, if we think about modern testing, and I think about Alan Page and, like the illities, uh, reliability, accessibility, securability, trustability. Um, uh, there's also cost. Like, hey, this is great. Oh, You've got yeah. the software to function, but it costs so much to operate it. Ugh, we can't use it. It's not. It's a bad business move. We can't do that. Or it consumes the battery. Like there's a resource efficiency wise. It uses so much battery. I just uninstalled the app. I'm done. Uh, it Henry, gets my cell about. phone yeah. so hot that it's uh, frying my butt cheek. I smell bacon all day. What's going on with your application? <laughs> what, what's if happening? Your, if your butt cheek is made of ba bacon, that's a <laughs> different problem, I think. <laughs> 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 exactly. Well, although, how delicious. We are all special. I, mean, that's, <laughs> yeah, I think I mean, that's just unique. To add, I mean, if, if the user has to read, uh, it, it needs to go to a two weeks training to use your app, I think there is a problem as well. So if you need to just to create a quote on your system and then suddenly you open the system and then and you say, what the hell? Where should I? Okay. Yeah. So I think, yeah. please, when you design application, make sure that it's usable and easy to use as well because uh, it doesn't make sense to train people. It's, uh, it's just doesn't make sense. We are in 2021. And, and, and another one, uh, those um, requirements that fall into functional. And sorry, yeah. I will just get into this uh, quickly. <laughs> Negative testing. Some of those were, oh, yeah. hey, this should not accept this type of uh, information. It's part of the functionality. It yeah. shouldn't accept emojis. It shouldn't accept blah, blah, blah. It shouldn't accept SQL injection. Okay. Isn't that but, security? But wait a minute, that's testing? security, that's non-functional. That's, that's non-functional, but still a negative but is test. It? Yeah. So <laughs> to me, to me, as you hear the three of us going on humorously about this, um, so you hear the three of us going on and on humorously about this, and the, the statement I'll make, and I've made it before, is there's really no, everything is a functional requirement, 
if you're not, if you're being inclusive of the holistic experience of the application. So the number one thing that you'll see almost every performance tool do is measure time, whether it's mm. response time from a request, whether it's time spent in a percentage of time as CPU resource percent, um, you can think of them, but it's like time spent in garbage collection, time spent on the wire, time spent for an IO request to the disk. Um, and there's lots of different ways to think about time. Take that all the way to the button that you're going to press. It's the, the temporal aspect of functionality over time. And that's the one thing, like if you don't have any requirements, no acceptance criteria, no one's even thought about performance or these other illities, you can start by saying, well, here's the functional user story, the way we think this is gonna function. Where are the critical points where time is gonna make this critical or the critical points where a user would be disappointed if it were slow. A group of users would be very disappointed if everyone couldn't use the system and it got too slow because 200 people or 2,000 people were on the system at the same time. And then you are starting to jump function. into the SRE realm and everything intersects now and you have uh, 10 requirements for the same thing. Yeah, yeah, but the, 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 there's other things that uh, uh, a functional requirement won't think about. I mean, especially, mm -hmm. oh, I'm delivering this app. So it means potentially this app could be used by a user in his browser or a user in his mobile device. And, yeah. you know, mobile device, we can work with that. We can take train with that. We can be in the airport yeah. with that. We can be, and here suddenly you can have a requirement say, hey, I need to use it, whatever the network, whatever happens in the train connectivity yeah. and a connectivity i need to be able to press on the button and get something out of the of the uh, that actions and this is this yeah. is a functional requirement in a technical technical world but it makes sense at the end as a yeah, user i will world. probably face that situation exactly. yeah, yeah i once got in trouble because i was using my phone um in heathrow going through the security stuff this was you know after 9 11 i think but in the in the the global world of whatever. To, and I got in trouble with the security people because I just had my phone out. And I'm like, oh, 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 guys, let, let me finish up. And they're like, no, 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 give me your phone. Did you take any pictures? And then I'm like, show me your picture. We went through the pictures and I, I had taken a couple pictures like, hey, I'm coming home, going through Heathrow. And Heathrow is, some airports are beautiful. They have these fantastic atriums and things, right? And Does they're like, sense? you know, I, I just, I need to see you delete these from your phone and then I'll let you go through. So it, it so makes like, sense to, I had to, to make sure that done. <laughs> it makes yeah, sense to make sure that you don't have any pictures of your uh, bacon butt uh, on your phone. Because it could... <laughs> <laughs> no, that, Not I, only I but dialing, but butt pictures. <laughs> but, but any type of ass picture you have, we don't, yeah. Because the, the TSA is going to see that and they're like, what is that? It smells like bacon. <laughs> Um, no, no, on, honestly, you're, you're right. Uh, so the usability of an application, even from an accessibility standpoint is interesting. If response time is too fast and you don't see stuff or you have to interact more slowly because you have delays in your interactions, um, visually impair all the different things. So that's why I'm saying not just performance, but all these other areas, they get cast into this sort of negative space called non-functional and it's not it's not really non-functional it's definitely part of functionality our experience of life right now right now time is flowing time is passing as i speak oh, more slowly yeah. you notice right oh, right there did you see that that was that was time right over there so i'm feeling it you're feeling it you think I'll you're be okay? feeling the passage of time yeah <laughs> exactly uh, leaves of grass. That's right. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's all that really gets me. Right. But, um, uh, Leandro brings up the fast, good and efficient kind of areas. And those are kind of the easiest place to start. If somebody's like, well, we don't know what performance requirements are. Fast is response time. Good is sort of like, what's the experience? Like we were saying, Leandro, you said, is it performing well for you? Like a, like a dance performance. Is it pleasing? Is it Hey, we, you know, the app functioned pretty good, but it didn't perform very well. Well, it was fast. Well, no, I don't mean that. I mean, it was kind of clumsy. 
or it wasn't smooth. Um, and that's that's. An I didn't understand well, then, the next steps or yeah, you know, yeah. Things. And then efficiency is probably the biggest one, Henrik, in the observability world, as we're seeing traces through a system to see where resources you should, where you're spending time on each node of a system or an, an extended system. And so efficiency is part of tracing and being able to see resource usage uh, or just time spent in a queue, time spent wandering down a wire to the wrong host. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that's those three are a good place to start as well. If you if you find, hey, our functional requirements or our, fun our user stories don't really have any information about is it fast, is it good, is it efficient? Yeah, but um, on, on that line, I would say just be careful to not to make a, a one ring to rule them all. And uh, we start uh, thinking about time, everything under two seconds. No, just make sure and try to make all of those context sensitive. What are you doing? What are you yeah. talking about? And there you will have some of the others that I was mentioning earlier, where yep. you will start to think about databases, infrastructure, if it goes to the load balancer, how it should. There, there are many, yeah. many things that um, once the team gets together and you know the nature of your beast, you'll be able to uh, suggest and propose some new requirements that are uh, relevant to that beast. Or if yeah. they are not, well, just don't uh, waste the time of the team. But it's, it's yeah. really important that you depart, at least from those base performance requirements, and yeah. intersect them with the rest. It's very important with those... Oh no, non-functional shouldn't touch functional. Like, no, no, they are they are touching each other constantly in very dirty yeah. ways. And you should allow them. But this it's, it's an HR <laughs> violation. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bacon Butt, come on. They are the it's requirements. Like... <laughs> they are the requirements. They can do whatever they want. <laughs> That's not right. Uh so <laughs> let's, let's 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 go ahead. I was uh, just gonna add that also. Uh, in 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 as a functional requirement, you don't touch but touch to sort of the architecture. And now these days, we we all have been transitioning to the cloud. So um, yeah, there, there is also a notion as it it not performance, but it's indirectly related. It's the fact that environment on the call in in the cloud could be expensive. So uh, as as a performance engineer, you need to make sure that okay, my application is scales supports that many users if you have if you have any spikes but in the other side yeah. you need to make sure that okay you can handle the load but if it costs you 100 times more then maybe there's a problem of efficiency so uh, that there is also balance between you should make sure to measure that uh, how how if there is any yeah. impact on the cost the way this architecture or the way the system works as of now. So this is also no, a non-functional requirement, but at the end, as a product owner or a, pro, a product leader, uh, I, I would definitely make sure that my, once my project is finished, that I won't be sort of being, have any issues with the organization because what I just delivered in production is, yeah, too expensive to manage. Yeah, yeah. And don't, definitely don't orphan, orphan all of these other illities uh, that would mm. keep going beyond even performance, because there could be risk in each area that you're not at least having a conversation with, uh, to, to our former conversation about uh, teaching and making sure we're facilitating those conversations and bringing them to light. Uh, so I encourage you to do that. This is, this is a good conversation. Uh, Henrik, do you have any closing thoughts on performance requirements moving forward? I uh, would say that, uh, yeah, like we said, try to be the uh, advisor or uh, try to learn and, and, and coordinate the team together to, to, ma to make them understand this, uh, the importance of performance and everyone can contribute to that. And that will be, yeah. I think, uh, a way of getting the information that you need to deliver properly uh, an efficient performance engineering tasks or, or project. Um, cool. And secondly, I would say if you don't have no one in an organization that have no clue about requirements, yeah, someone has decided to put 100K or 100 millions on the table for this ap specific application. So probably yeah. that person has a couple of requirements behind the scenes. So yeah, try to be smart yep. uh, and try to yeah. uh, connect with the various uh, stakeholders of your organization to get the right information. Yep. Very good. 
Leandro, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, on, the, on the first part, I totally agree. And I will repeat what Hendrik said. Make sure that everyone in the team has awareness of those uh, performance requirements, how they intersect with the rest, and how and why do should the team care about them. And yeah. I, I would also suggest to get some insights, some better information, get out of that kind of comfort zone, watch a little bit of, uh, is it observable or watch a lot of it so that you learn some other topics yeah. and elements that you need to observe and pay attention. Because most probably you will have some requirements that you may not have been aware. Your performance engineer um, of trust may be able to tell you, hey, you should check this, check that, pay attention to this, put these gateways here. Don't do this in development, do that in production and vice versa. So uh, make sure that you also have a wider perspective, not just response time, response time, SLA, 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 that you understand what other things will impact on your performance, where should yeah. you be careful, and how your performance may impact some other elements in your solution. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My And my only last thought is for... Uh, people that are bringing the old uh, non-context driven, you know, I need to write down all the requirements. It needs to be in a document. If you're still in that waterfall phase and it's working for you, there's nothing wrong with being that thorough and really detailing it out. Maybe in those old mechanisms, you'll be doing it electronically. You might do it interactively uh, with the teams. You might, uh, you might have new ways of doing it, but thinking that way is not wrong. Just don't do it in a silo. Just bring that experience for people that work more dynamically, more interactively, even if it's virtual through chat or uh, you know I interactive online ways of working nowadays. Um, bring bring those questions. Uh, I love James does this great uh, presentation talk around ask a performance question. Um, that's just a great simple way to get the conversation started, and then keep going further into it. Um, I want to thank if I, Henrik if and I may, Leandro. I want to ask oh, yes, of just course. quickly before we leave, because you just got me thinking, and I, that's one that I want oh, everyone no. also to be aware with requirements. <laughs> Don't Stop thinking requirements old in the old ways. Though that, that six number that you said in the forehead, I think that oh, yeah, I yeah. just thought about it. It's really, really important. We're in 2020, almost two, 2022. We survived yeah. 2020. And... Uh, we should be thinking in those ways. We have agile requirements, continuous requirements, several things that impact our performance differently. Yep. Stop thinking just on those response times and that it has everything to be under those yeah, six yeah. seconds you don't, with you don't, 666 milliseconds, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And you don't, you don't have to have a universal generic re requirement that never no. changes and is there forever. Um, quite frankly, we've proven that that doesn't work as an industry. Um, mm. It was better than doing nothing, but everyone is pretty much doing something at this point, even new development teams. So yeah, I agree with you, Leandro. Lean into that context, understand the context. I'm going to take a measurement. I'm going to ask a question and you know, just do enough for that minimum viable performance and then come around in a couple iterations and say, you know what, that thing that's running three seconds response time. Uh, we're finally getting some feedback that maybe that's not fast enough or doesn't scale. So maybe you'll have come back to it and tune it and optimize it. And that's, uh, that's an important thing as well. Yeah. No, no universal oh, yeah. blanket statements. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. All right. So let's say thank you to Henrik and Leandro. You guys are doing a bang up job in the YouTube world. Thanks for inviting me to my first YouTube-ness in the Perf Bytes sort of, <laughs> I guess, kind of the first one with you guys. This has been really, really good. So I'll say thank you uh, to everyone who's watching um, and thank you to uh, Modern Technology to make all of this possible. Oh, that's pretty and cool. I will add, Leandro. if you enjoyed oh, today's yeah. episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel because there will be more Leave episodes going on on YouTube. So don't, don't hesitate to look, use the, the, the thumb, the, the ring yeah. bell and subscribe button because uh, it, it will help us to grow and build and produce more episodes yeah. for you guys. And leave a comment, as as uh, Henry uh, Leandro was just saying. Leave a comment. Go go put the social media tag to someone else who should be watching this show, and then get them to come leave a comment 
and do another tag to somebody else who should be watching this show. And we'll just keep it going. Just share it with five people and tell them to share it with five other people and so on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so on and so on and so on. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's, uh, that would be good. Our coming upcoming episodes will be who knows what. We're still going to do some more revisiting of older topics. We have some tutorials coming under the performacology world. Uh, check, out our, check out the new books. Uh, special thanks to all the different sponsors that we have. You may have seen an ad at the beginning of the of this episode, but that may change. So special thanks to anyone that is sponsoring Perf Bites right now. We appreciate your support. Um, and maybe we'll see you at Dynatrace Perform. Henrik might be getting helping us get uh, plugged in there. So uh, that would be kind of fun. Um, are you guys going to be traveling or doing anything recently in the in the in the near future? Uh, I will be in Paris uh, for and Marseille for two conferences, and probably in in Amsterdam, yeah. a big enough in December. But otherwise, okay. my big uh, rendezvous, I would say, is uh, going back to US uh, after two years uh, and yeah. meet uh, everyone at uh, Vegas for perform in Las Vegas. Yeah. 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 On my side, uh, if everything goes well, which so many things are in the air right now, hopefully I'll be having a German Christmas and enjoying the snow over there. Uh, yes. If things don't get ugly, uh, may do a tiny Euro trip. Some places don't know yet where. And cool. we'll be reporting from there. You'll see videos on some new podcast, Espanol as well. And a French. very, very special Christmas special from Pedophiles Espanol is coming. So if you like Spanish, cool. if you like poem stories, you'll have a performance poem story for Christmas. Yeah, yeah. I, Hen Henrik, I, I, I miss, uh, I miss uh, sort of grumbly, gruffly voice Santa from the Santa pack. Oh, you know. Who's was all the that. one that smoked a lot, yeah. <laughs> em emphysema Santa. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was hilarious you know uh, uh, I, ate oh. too much, I ate it too much bacon the last few years and, oh. and too much too much butt bacon yeah exactly <laughs> that's nice thank you guys okay yes. all right thank We're you out. everybody thank you guys have it. ciao sure, have a good one adios see you bye